Hi, everybody. Hopefully this isn't too loud. It's a small room. Uh, Justin Barenbaum, 505 Games. I lead the biz dev team and also strategic relations. My team's responsible for finding all the new content we publish, as well as managing all the overarching relationships with first parties, Google, Apple, Amazon, Nintendo, Valve, whoever else we can publish on. Uh, primary role is finding great talent, developers, signing deals, and trying to make money. So cut it in a nutshell. <laughs> Let's be honest. That's, we're trying to make great games and make money at the same time. Um, I've been in the industry for a little over 20 years. Started in 93 at a division of Capcom called g, &G. I was literally selling games as a store manager slash, uh, I guess, mail order manager. Moved into customer support. Then have done everything from developers to publishing to publishing to developers and consulting in between, and now I'm trying to find good content, so somebody's got good content. Um, yeah, hi, Klaas, um, Flare Games, uh, we would be called a third party publisher for most people, although we would like to see ourselves as a co-development publisher or co-developer, uh, mobile only, free to play only, uh, you've probably seen uh, our beautiful key art on most of the badges from our latest release, uh, Nonstop Night. Um, in a former life, I founded Gameforge and scaled it to around 650 people and 150 million in annual revenue in five years. Um, and now I'm in my, in my I'm in mobile. Hey, I'm John Robinson from Nexon. Um, for those who don't know, we're the biggest game company in Korea. Uh, we've also got a sizable uh, business growing here in the West. Uh, our mobile group is right here in San Francisco over in Emeryville. Uh, I focus on business development for the mobile side of things, and we do everything from publishing to investments to uh, M&A. Uh, me personally, I worked at EA for a long time. After that, started my own indie game studio uh, before joining Nexon. My name is Jeff Hilbert. I own Starting Point. Uh, Starting Point works with mainly independent development studios, and we help them on the business side, give them funding, structure the company, do some strategic advice. I also founded and am an active joint uh, board member of a company called DDM. It's an agency uh, where we represent independent game developers, and we passed raised six hundred fifty million dollars as the close of last year. So pretty proud of that. Um, I also founded a studio called First Strike Games up in Seattle, and that's going really well. So I'm on the dev side, and um, so there you have it. So between DD, I, I'm, these guys are pretty much on the publisher side. I'm on the other side. So with independent development, we were gang adding this the other day. With independent developers, DDM did about 650 million in raises for content. I've done about another 300 million myself. So I've been doing this a while. So I come in the other side where you guys are. <laughs> well, except for John. You're my That's why you're sitting on the left and yeah, we are okay, over here. Yeah. <laughs> they put you between right. us because we're enemies. Yeah. <laughs> well, I've, I've had the opportunity to work with, with all of you on the panel in different capacities, uh, either opposite. Uh, opposite the table in Justin's case or uh, representing the, representing each of the others uh, and their companies in some, some capacity. But before we start talking about what's a disruptive model, what's a new model, I think we really want to go over what, what the old model was and why it needed to be changed in the first place. So so again, I think I'm going to start with Jeff because as, as he's mentioned, he's been involved in, a, in close to a billion dollars in development dollars raised over the years. Walk us through sort of what the old model was and, and I don't want to say broken, but why it needed to, to have some, some sort of novelty inserted into there. I never thought the old model was broken. Um, it really was a risk reward thing. It was really up to the development studios to stand up and take it themselves because the publishers didn't. But really the hard thing with the old model was the strictly advanced and the way they recruit and the fire and forget. You would have a team, and this is when we're doing big council games, the team would be 80 or 100 people, you get your last milestone check, and then nothing maybe some debugging, maybe a little bit of support, maybe some later releases in different territories, but you go from 100 people to 30 people to two. And you couldn't be shopping. And at the end of the game, when you're, when you're at beta is really when you need to be shopping your next game, because the betas would last about six months. You need to be shopping your next game, but that's when you're the busiest finishing up your old game. So where the model really started getting broken was these huge cliffs. Whether you had five people or whether you had 500 people on the project, zero is still a zero coming in. And just trying to float those teams at the end because publishers really were tight with the money. There's really no extra money laying around at the end of a project. And then royalties were pretty much unheard of 
just because of the way they did the recoups. Um, that's pretty much the old model. What, but were any other factors such as the new platforms or the live services or the, the, the ongoing content? The big, the big change has been the live services. I think that's been the biggest change. And publishers right now realize we have to keep the developers healthy. And if they find a good developer at the end of a project, instead of going down from 100 people, you're down to 80. Or if it's a true free-to-play game, you actually go up. You staff up, and you can count on keeping that team around for a while. And that allows you to build healthy companies. It allows you to bring middle management. Then after you're operating the game for about a year, some of the mid-level guys are ready to be leads. And you can now slowly build the second team and load balance your studios. What about from the publisher perspective, Justin? What, what about the mitigation of risk or the risk profile of those kind of deals? Well, coming from Activision, which was probably the uh, capital of risk mitigation, meaning that they, <laughs> they paid for everything and then developers got pretty much nothing at the end, uh, going to a company like 505 where we can't afford to pay people off, so we have to kind of form true partnerships uh, and kind of share the risk. It's been an interesting road. Uh, I used to have vehement disagreements with Bobby Kotick, who those don't know is probably one of the most hated people in the industry from a lot of sides. Super smart, head of Activision. He um, had a philosophy about there was no reason to be a first mover in the space. It was always better to buy your way in later, and that's great when you've got three or four billion dollars in cash in the bank. When you have three or four million dollars in cash in the bank, it makes you be a little more resourceful. So we've just had to get more. I think it's we've had to get more creative. We can't we can't compete with those people. So if we don't get creative, we don't have a business. Awesome. Any, any opinions on that from GameForge to where you are now with Blair? How, do, how does your approach, how has it changed? Or, I, or what's changed in, the, in those models between those companies? I guess the main, the main difference is, is the, the life ops, as Jeff said. But on top of that, the whole process of developing a game. Because when you look at, at most developers out there, they don't have the infrastructure and skills to run live ops at a scale that is necessary with all the know-how that is necessary and the infrastructure that is necessary to do so. Um, so your job as a publisher completely changes. You have to help the developer to make the best out of the game. So that's tweaking economy design, sparring on design decisions, and really mutually build the best game that you can potentially build from whatever the game is, uh, the team is building. And then uh, having a live team and having part of the live team on your side as well. It's uh, where the expertise is and where you can really leverage the learnings uh, on scale between all the games, between the, your whole portfolio, technical from a best practice uh, standpoint as well as cross-promotional, which in the end everybody profits from. Uh, for that to work, it's most important to align the interests completely. Um, so for example, how, how we do it at Flare Games, um, we do a P&L view of the game and we share the profits 50-50. Uh, we take the risks, we recoup, and then everybody profits in the end. And everything that we spend for a game is pretty much an investment in the game. And suddenly it's not a, hey, and the publisher did that and it was stupid, or the developer uh, did that and that was stupid, but we have a shared interest. Everything that we spend on a game is investment in the game, and everything is invested in terms of making a profit down the road. And then it's very, very easy to assess every, every single publishing decision that you take over the lifetime of a product. John, how about Nexon? What's Nexon's philosophy on, on, on the deals? Uh, yeah, I think it's, it's somewhat similar to what Klaus said. But um, yeah, previously, like I guess at, at EA, it was like, you know, with the EA partners being the biggest kind of, you know, third party publisher back in the day, it was making really big bets. You decide on how much marketing to apply to that. And then, you know, a week or two after launch, you know how much money you know, you've made at that point, um, how successful the game will be. For us now, it's like when, when we make bets, it's not making bets necessarily on games, but rather making bets on companies because we're going to be in development for 18 to 24 months, and then a company is going to run that game hopefully for, you know, three years, five years, 10 years if it's successful, um, which is why we think about much deeper partnerships because we see it as kind of helping a company grow much more than them just executing on one specific game idea. I think, real quick, Jeff mentioned it earlier, the fire and forget for us, I call it the scud missile approach. You build it, you fire it, and hope it hits a target. Everybody moves on and moves to the next thing. That doesn't work anymore. There is no fire and forget even for console games. It's You have to have a great relationship with the developer and keep plan to keep working with them for a very long time after, or there is no success. And also, too, John brought up probably the best point. Um, I've noticed that a lot of the, the good publishers, Nexon falls into that category. I've just never worked with 505, so I don't have an opinion. We've had people that work with Flare. Um, 
you're pitching the game. They're going to ask about the technology, but you really know what they're interested in is when they start to actually really ask you about you and ask you about your team because they're investing more in the team, especially in a live game, because you guys are going to be working so closely together and there's going to be so many iterations during development that you're, what you design now, what's on the shelf in 18 months, I always like comparing the old design documents and then comparing it with, with the game that actually shipped. And you're like, I could see the influence. So it's become more and more important. And it's really interesting watching the publishers because you guys really are more investing in people. And like, I'm sorry, Justin, I can't speak. I, I just haven't worked with 505, but I've heard that you guys do as well. I mean, Payday worked out pretty well with Starbucks. You know. I don't think you, either of us are complaining too much. So it, uh, again, that was a pure partnership. It literally was 50-50. Uh, we handled uh, the, the I call it the unsexy stuff, the QA, localization, rating, and marketing, submissions. Um, they did a lot of their own marketing. They did their own community management. We just helped them with that, helped fund that stuff. And uh, everything was pretty much like Klaus said 50-50 at that point. Now, not every deal is that way, depending on who brings what in. But at the end of the day, the best thing is cutting really big checks to developers because we're only doing that if we're making money. Well, talking about the, you know, the, the deeper partnerships and the, and the long range uh, relationship that you're gonna have, the first new structure, quasi new structure I wanna talk about is a combination sort of equity deal and publishing deal. So uh, a lot of companies are, are doing that at the outset, saying we know that after the game launches, uh, there, there's, there's gonna be a publishing window and an opportunity, but also we're investing in the company on, as a whole. So they take a Series A position, usually you know, less, less than 20% uh, usually on that, uh, but they pay the premium on that and they have a board seat and they, they have this deep relationship. Um, you know, I, know, I know Nexon has done that in the past in, in some cases, and I know a lot of companies that are, that are doing that. Uh, you know, John, do you wanna you know, start off talking about the advantages or, or, or what makes that attractive for you? Sure, it? again, kind of talking about the old days when you think about what developers were really building up when they were launching big games, it was around kind of an IP that they could follow on with, and now what we see developers really building uh, over the course of the first few years of a partnership is the know-how and the ability to operate games. Um, so we definitely like to invest uh, with equity and, and typically do multi-game deals um, just because the business is so hard and free-to-play is so challenging that I think it just takes a few years for, for a developer to really kind of get that, get that, know, yeah, get that know-how and, and kind of mature the team. Um, and we want to know that after we help them grow and they help us get better, um, you know, the relationship isn't going to end there, but rather we'll have an opportunity to continue to take it from that first game couldn't agree more I mean we only we usually do multi-title deals too uh, we don't have the deep pockets of the next one so taking an equity position up front is usually out of our reach um, but uh, we, we retain the option at several deals um, and uh, buying developers that the relationship really works out with is part of our strategy and on those on those type of deals obviously you know they're, they're traditionally taking a board seat uh, there's a much more deep immersive uh, relationships so, so that they can really share knowledge, uh, I think. And I think it also takes away some of the, some of the antagonism of sort of the old deals with the producers uh, on, on both sides sort of fighting it over, but uh, over what, what's good in the game or not. You're, you, you tend to be, at the outset, thinking you're more on the same team. So I think that that's certainly important. Practically speaking, it's all about the relationship and sometimes it can be pretty an antagonistic when it's just, when you know it's one game and everyone's trying to maximize for the next 12 months. Um, but when you know, when a company knows that you know, their partner, their publishing partner owns a part of them, um, you know, that can help just develop the relationship. Right. Right. You see more I, oh, companies doing those kind I'm, of things? I'm the opposite. Okay. No equity. Um, we really, really shy away from equity. As a matter of fact, it's less than 2% of the deals we've ever done have ever involved equity. And that's close to a billion dollars. Why? Um, initially do equity. I agree with these guys that you want to have a vested interest, but as soon as a company invests in your company, let's just say your company's worth $10 million. If they put in $3 million, depending on how you structure, or they, they put in $3 million, or I'm sorry, they put in $1 million, they own 10% of your company, depending on how you structure it, a lot of other companies are like, I'm not going to touch you guys. I don't want to go do a, a business development deal with you guys because I'm pretty sure that these guys who initially invested in you have first and matching rights for any equity deal. And if we start to build a hit, they're going to swoop in and buy you, even if the game they made with your with that first company isn't as strong. Also, at 20%, they're on your board. Or they can be on your board at 1%. As soon as they're on your board, they get to look at every single major piece of paperwork that comes into that company, and they have access to all that paperwork. 
So if he, if 505 invested in us and Claus is looking at doing a game with us, Justin gets to see everything that Flair is doing. So we lean away from it and you don't know how the relationship is gonna go. That said, once we're in production, once we get to know the other party and it's going well, we want equity. It's the exact, we're like begging, hey, we want equity, this is working out great, we wanna have a long-term relationship, and God knows we do not wanna shop the team again. We do not wanna shop our next game. We like you, we wanna stay. And we wanna make games, not shop games. That's a big mantra, and that's why I do like the equity, just not at the beginning. Well, I always say I'd rather farm than hunt, so I'd rather work with somebody once. Uh, 505 generally doesn't take equity positions, Although we try to structure deals that create a long-term interest because we don't want to see a lot of success a la payday and then have them walk away and have somebody like Ubisoft offer them five times as much money for the next one and we can't touch it and it goes away after we help build the success. So there are some things you can do in a deal without taking equity to secure a long-term partnership. Some of the smaller deals we've done, we've had options for equity if the first game is successful. So there are different structures, but you know, my lawyers hate me because every deal I've done, and I've probably done 50 at 505, has been different because it depends on the developer, it depends on the, the deal, it depends on what they're looking for, what we need. Um, so we can't do one standard form. Patrick loves it because it racks up his billable hours. But uh, all, of, all of our lawyers hate it because every deal is not cookie cutter. So I think, you know, while we will look at companies to do equity, our first focus is making that first game together. And if a relationship's going really well, we will look to do a second game or equity but uh, I, we feel it's much more like dating, and sometimes you're just not gonna be compatible. And, and you can get to the end of a game, and it could be a good game or not a good game, and you just could not, you can agree to disagree in part ways. Or you could love each other and wanna get married, so it just really depends. So we try to treat, treat each deal differently, and every situation differently. I agree on the relationship working being a prerequisite for an equity investment to make sense. I mean, uh, life is short, and you don't wanna work with assholes. Um, it's just not worth it. And so it should be fun and productive and, and really great to work with a developer and not like a hassle or argument. Yeah, this business is hard, They're really hard. So if you're not working with people you like, you probably should move on. Yeah, I, I think the big thing is relationships have changed a lot. Publishers are taking it a little bit more seriously. It used to be the only the hardware manufacturers did the deals where you'd sign a big deal with them. And even if you didn't have a project rolling off, they would figure out some way to pay your guys to keep you developing on their platform. So it was only the hardware manufacturers that did that now. Now we're seeing a lot more with the, with the other publishers. They're like, wow, we really like you. We don't have a second project. You have something rolling off. What do you, who do you have available? Oh, you have some artists. Can you put your artists on this project over here? I know it's not your project, but we don't want them to go anywhere else. So there's been a lot more investment in that. And also too, what I've, now that I think, I'm kind of looking at this row, People making the decisions, a lot of them have made games now. A lot of them have run development studios. A lot of them have actually made games. We used to have a lot of junior people that said, my boss's boss in marketing said you need to do this. And we'd look at it and go like, you're high. We can't do that. It just can't be done. We're seeing a lot more of the publishers taking developer relationship a lot more seriously and putting people on like this panel. <laughs> Well, it's, it's nice when you have people at the top that actually play games now. You know, I would say, you know, for the most part, almost everybody in our company plays games. Uh, my boss plays games all the time. Uh, and I think it helps because there's a fundamental understanding of what it takes to make a game. I still don't know how to make a game. Don't ask me to make one, but I know what goes into making one. And I think that goes a long ways towards understanding how difficult it is start to finish to make a game. And our job as a publisher is to try to remove as many of those obstacles as possible so the developer could focus on making the game. You know, the smart publishers aren't suits anymore. Justin, uh, you, mentioned, you mentioned that none of your deals tend to look the same, and, and I know that because I've been opposite you on a, a handful of them. But, um, yeah, probably. So uh, I, want, I want to talk about 505's approach to, to some of the, the novel ways that they're doing things, right? You mentioned Payday. Uh, there's the Lab Zero deal, which has been out in the, out in the public. Uh, obviously, I think you, you, we touched on the reasons why you can't necessarily 
stick with the traditional approach to development deals where you can't compete with any you know, Ubisoft and the, and the big dollars. Well, let's be clear. Neither do we want to. We don't want right. to be in that place. So, but, but talk about some of the, so the creative ways you're doing, you're getting around that problem. We'll talk, talk about Lab Zero a little bit as, as much as you can. I think that's probably the best example because most of the Lab Zero deal um, is public because we were very upfront, honest. Uh, unlike our friends at Sony with the deal they did with the crowdfunding. So, hey, I can be honest. I know who did the deal. So. Um, <laughs> So we actually put, we met uh, with the folks from Lab Zero quite a while ago. For those who aren't familiar, they're the ones that made the game Skullgirls. Um, and if they'd pitched me that game originally, I would have said a Western dev doing a fighting game that's kind of Eastern style, no way. I would have never, uh, maybe I would have never signed it. But after they'd done that and all the success, we'd met with them a number of times, just got along really well with the head of the studio and figured out we want to work on something, whether it's today, tomorrow, months, years from now. Uh, Peter came back to us at some point with this great pitch for this game, but it was a little too expensive for a new IP for us to go, okay, we're in. So we came up with probably one of the most complex deals that I've ever done, uh, where we funded a prototype, they built it, they put it up, they ran a crowdfunding campaign on Indiegogo with a flat out goal of 1.5 million, and we guaranteed to fund the rest of the game publicly if they hit that 1.5 million. Uh, it was a stretch, it was a fight, Probably asked for a little too much money, but they're at 1.95 now. We've come over the top to fund the rest of it. We're doing all the publishing, all the QA, local rating, and they're just focused on making the game now. Um, it was, again, the deal was super complex in the back end. They're getting a much larger piece because they're bringing a lot more to the table. Uh, we're bringing a lot more to the table because we guaranteed a pretty hefty investment. Um, so I think that was a really interesting approach. A developer we really liked, Peter really liked us and the way we operated. Uh, and we tried to come at it from a point of, okay, this is a very fair, equitable deal. How do we structure this? How does everybody win or nobody loses too much if it doesn't go through? Um, and again, it's just getting creative. It's finding people you want to work with and, and finding a way to work with them. It doesn't always work. There's companies we want to work with and it's failed miserably. Has 505 looked into doing more of those kinds of deals or are you waiting to see how this approach works first? Uh, we're looking into a couple right now. I think it's about finding, is there's, I don't think there's a lot of developers that have that experience of running a crowdfunding campaign more than once. Right have been successful and have a community that believes they'll do it again. So I think it's there's a combination of things that need to have happen, but if we have the right developer come to us, absolutely. I think also that you know, your first point there is that you, you met Peter and you met the studio and you wanted to work with him on something, which ties back to the earlier point. You want to work with the studios that, that you believe in and, and that have passion for them. And I think Klaus says at this point, we, we just uh, there's no reason to work with people we don't like. Right. Uh, I think at the end of the day, you know, I, that's part of the other model has changed. The, the developers used to work with publishers just because they had the big checkbook, even if they didn't necessarily like the biz dev people there or the head, heads of, now, I mean, I think the power has switched a little bit, in particular for most developers. The really high quality ones can kind of pick and choose a little bit who they want to work with. So why, they're not going to work with somebody they don't like. And it's more important as well because there are much more touch points. It's not like a producer coming in like every three weeks looking at the current status quo and otherwise you see the BizDev people. It's like hands-on work together on, on a mutual title. Yeah, correct. It's, it's very much, it is, it is co-development even if technically we don't have developers in-house. We are very much involved in every aspect we can be while still trying to be as hands-off as possible because we're not making the game. And have it, uh, what can you say, if anything, about what 505 did with, say, Payday or what they've done with Abzu? Are those more traditional deals, or what can you what can you talk about there? Uh, again, I think Payday was an interesting. It's more traditional from a funding sense, uh, but it was was definitely not a traditional relationship. They actually drove most of the marketing on what they wanted to do. They came to us, we want to do this, help fund it. We want to do this, help fund it. They drove the community. Um, we basically did, like I said, all the unsexy stuff, the QA, localization, ratings, support, scheduling stuff for E3, booking the booths for E3, all the stuff that no developer really wants to do, I don't think. Uh, we took care of all that stuff. They focused on making the game. You're right, no developer wants to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm but that's, that. I mean, that's, that's I, think, I think it's one of those things that developers don't understand how much goes into that stuff until they have to do it themselves. Um, and I think that's where a publisher can add a lot of value. We've got experience, we've got learnings, we have all those relationships, connections. You know, am I going to tell you which outsource artists you should be using? No, that's up to you. If you don't know what artists you should be using, I probably don't want to do a deal with you. So I think that, and then the giant squid deal, again, was complicated. You happen to be the lawyer on the other side again. Um, they came in with some funding, we came in with some funding. Some ways that looks traditional, some ways it very much doesn't. They still own the IP, even though we invested far more than the majority of the game. Uh, 
it's, again, every deal just depends. We like to get creative when we can. From the publisher side, do you, do you guys like it when the developers come with some level of external funding already? And, and I imagine that's great because it's less out, less a risk for you, but it also comes with some problems potentially, right? They have a vision of the game that may not match, and, uh, you know, and, and how does that play into things? Does that matter? Um, it doesn't really matter. We are pretty agnostic on that. I mean, uh, it shows at least some proof that we are not the only ones seeing something right. there, right? Uh, from a risk, risk perspective, it's nice. And then it brings some flexibility to other aspects of the deal, like, for example, IP ownership and where that lies in the end. Um, it's about an individual approach, figuring out how it, how it can be structured in a way that the interests are still aligned and working together really makes sense for both parties for the long term. And if that is solved, I don't mind. Yeah, I think the market's moved a little bit in the last couple of years, and people are signing games, uh, especially mobile games, a little bit later in the development cycle, not at the concept stage. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think it's actually a very smart thing for small game developers to raise friends and family round or a small uh, angel or institutional round um, that to enable scare them. You, scare you off or scare next time. Well, uh, we, no, again, kind of the same thing. Yeah. Like uh, We like to follow smart money and smart mm -hmm. investors and good teams. We won't actually, for a mobile game, we won't step in until they at least have something playable at this point. It, it, a big playable. Uh, yeah, we're, we're seeing that too. The, also too, what a lot of publishers want you to do is launch the game in one territory, at least in beta. And they want to wait till they see some KPIs and retention and things like that. So just be prepared to do that. If you're in the mobile space, it's almost demand playable. Get it up. The best thing you can do as far as funding goes is get it up. Um, and the money, it, it also depends on where the money comes from. It's, some money's better than others, but then you have, <laughs> well, no, they, you have money that comes from a certain, like it might be a publisher. You'll see a lot of, of maybe a, Korean, a Chinese company invests in it, and then you want to go with it, someone like Nexon Worldwide, and certain publishers work better together than other publishers. So some people will walk away, some people will stay together. There's certain territories they want, there's certain territories they don't. So you really need, if you're going to raise money for a publisher in a certain territory, just make sure you're thinking about who your partners are and what territories they want. But I, I would them. second that point. That is crucial. Definitely think as, as you think about raising money or doing a deal, um, how open your partner is to uh, taking on additional uh, kind of kind of partners. There, yeah. <laughs> Communication. Uh, the one thing I will say is that we are, uh, I won't say over contact, but we're in constant contact with our partners. Um, just where how they're feeling, where they're at, what they need. Is there a problem? Is there a question? Can we help? I, I think that's the other thing that's changed. As Klaus mentioned, it used to be you, you send in a producer once a month to go visit the team. That was usually super disruptive because everybody on the team had to stop what they're doing, show everything off. Now it's much more uh, about a communication. Sometimes we'll send somebody there for a couple weeks. They stay out of the way, but they're just there to help, whether it's especially when you get to the point where you're starting to get to QA, localization, ratings, submissions just to kind of do all that stuff so the team can focus on making the game. So I think that's a big change. It's, I won't call it embedded, but it's, it's much more of a let's figure out how to make this together versus I'm going to come over and tell you what's going on. We actually go with a, with a close to embedded and, uh, uh, approach. So we have a publishing team on our side when we work together with a developer with dedicated people that just work on this title, uh, and they are part of the team. So the team that builds the game is the part, uh, the part of the team on the developer side, as well as our team. They are working together collaboratively on the parts that they are responsible for, not to disrupt, but to help to build something that is better. And then at certain points in the project, we really start embedding people too, if necessary. So for one of the developers we worked with, we sorted out problems they had in their backend by sending three back, uh, backend guys there and basically restructuring it in a way that it scales. Um, and to have that ability is like awesome. Well, I think Klaus, you bring up a good point. Obviously, the, the way you embed your guys in, in, into the process is also reflective in the way you structure your deals. And you mentioned before that, that it's 50-50 uh, after all the costs come out. Can you talk a little bit about more, more about your deal structure and the way you approach things in the development? Process? Sure. So we usually sign a game at a point in time, everything from early concept to in the middle of soft launch with proven KPIs. Um, we look at the game always on a PL level. So every every game has its own PL. We have investment, we look at the lifetime PL, we recoup our investment, and then everything is shared. Um, and all the costs that are in connection with the game are deducted. That can be QA, uh, that can be UA, that can be uh, agent fees. Um, <laughs> Who pays agents? <laughs> 
um, that can be people working on, on, the, on the game on our end, people working on the game on their end uh, with all the fluctuations in team size and team costs. Um, and um, it just makes sure that the inputs are aligned completely. Yours, yours tends to be less of a, of a, mile, a pure milestone approach, right? And we, we ignore milestones. Okay. So we uh, work under the assumption that everybody, when the interests are aligned, want to build the best possible games. And I have I've seen in the past that milestone schedules are destructive for that because people focus on building the next milestone and what was yeah. defined like a year ago to get their new check and not on the stuff that is most sensible for making a great game. That is why we are in constant contact and are working together with the developer to have this understanding on our end as well. And then you can just openly discuss it. Hey, we thought that we would be at that point in this point of time, but it's stupid and we should do another thing, right? Mm -hmm. And then we discuss and then we agree. We still have like hard gates where we want to have proof of things, obviously, but uh, they can be reflected in whatever implementation. I don't believe in milestone payments. Your thoughts it's a on, short on, version. On that, uh, effectively a burn rate deal. The, 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 the dates of the fake milestones are going away because you already said it. You have these false deliverables at the end of the month that everyone builds for, so the publisher could look at it and go like, okay, here's a bunch of boxes you check. Here's your check. And they really send you off your real development pathway. I don't believe in just pure burn rate deals because you have to have some metric. But when you're embedding somebody in and... The publishers are just different now. They actually pay attention to the team, and you can have a deliverable that's only code. And it really, well, what changed with the game? It used to be you'd show it to marketing, and marketing would be like, this looks just like the last build. It's like, no, we changed the matchmaking. You know, we did all this crazy back in engineering. But there's another thing, too. It's a disruptive model. Um, I just saw Mario in the back, uh, pickpocket in the back. They don't use a publisher because they figured out a model to get their own users. Now, they do work with publishers, they make games for publishers, they let those publishers publish the game, but then they share users, which is a complete disruption of the model. Well, whether you need a, a publisher or not is an entirely different panel. <laughs> what? Well, no, they, they yeah. you, but you yeah. guys still work with publishers, they publish, they publish their own games, they just share the users. They let the publisher go out and get them users for their game. But that's their, they're technically the developer for some of these huge IPs, and then they say, go publish. So there are other models out there. It's really about user acquisition and having a, a, net, a great footprint, and that works. That works for them. Does the does the burn rate deal is is that more successful because of the quality of, of the publisher side producers that they're embedded? Is it is it not work if the if the producers are not strong? You definitely need need stronger producers for that. Yeah, yeah. it's not like yeah. looking at stuff and holding it against the check uh, a box of checkpoints. Right. Um, you have to understand the game and really be be involved with everything with regards to the game on every discipline. And that requires a very senior, not only producer, but the whole publishing team. It's very senior people. And we usually staff our publishing teams with people that have like 10 years of experience plus um, because there is no real room for juniors there if you are working right. with one person per role dedicated. There is room for more junior persons if you have these staffed and then you can educate younger ones to f get in the footsteps. But um, that's probably the next step. I will also say the level of trust required in a burn rate deal is probably the top of the pile of trust um, because you have to know your partner's going to deliver. Uh, I do think the days of traditional milestones are over because it is a false flag. It's basically, it's a great way to hide that stuff's not going well because you, I, I know Next month, I've got to have a certain number of my team make sure we hit these check boxes, but the game's really messed up. We're just going to hide that from the publisher. And those used to go on forever, and you wouldn't really find out as a publisher there was problems until you were three or four months out from launching the game, and you'd literally see what I've got is absolutely nothing except a bunch of check boxes. So those milestones, in the days of the firm milestones, knowing two and a half years out that, that on January 20th, 2018, this is what I'm going to deliver, I mean, come on. So uh, I think... You know, we put schedules in place, but we usually let those schedules be dictated by the developer. And we work backwards. The developer says, okay, we think we need this much time to build what we're making. And then we work backwards. Okay, that means this, this, and this. And then those milestones, actually what's being delivered changes all the time. And it really is based on where the game at, how do we all feel is progressing, is this the right direction, is this the wrong direction. 
Um, but the traditional milestone schedule, it's, it was just a, it was a cover to make sure that people who didn't trust each other could get over on each other. They were asking for being frauded, basically. What about some of the, the new entrants in the space? Obviously, there's, you know, there's Lionsgate. Uh, it's been doing some, some co-publishing deals, as, as you know, Justin. Uh, you know, GameStop's been doing some things. Any, anybody have any opinions on how they ought to be approaching their, their publishing deals or how they are? Maybe when they cut me a check, I'll, uh, I'll tell them how they should be approaching their deals. Okay. That maybe you should go help them because they can pay you hourly for that. Well, actually, I do help some of them. So there you go. Uh, so I yeah. can't answer that, though. You know, it's hard for me to tell anybody else how to conduct their business, right? I mean, we, I have enough trouble figuring out how to conduct our business. I think, again, I think it's, it's always about the relationship. And are the people there dealing with the developers in the positions where they actually can build those relationships and that trust? And can they do what they say they're going to do? And at the end of the day, it, that's all that really matters. If you can't deliver what you say somebody, tell somebody you're going to deliver, then everything fails. So that goes from the developer side, that goes from the publisher side, that goes from the funding side. Um, and so I think the real question I have for the GameStops or some of the other people that are kind of entering the space is, do they really understand what they're getting themselves into? Because we look at all the entertainment companies that have jumped into space, spent two or three years there and gone, crap, we don't know what we're doing. They get out and then some executive, new executive comes in and goes, why aren't we doing this ourselves so we can make so much more money? They jump in, five years later they're out and they have massive layoffs. Uh, I, I, you know, as long as they put the right people in place and they're willing to fail for a long time before they're successful, great. I'm just not sure that most of them have the stomach for how difficult this business is when they haven't done it before. It took Warner, what, how many years? Eight years and three CEOs to become an overnight success? Well, let's not talk about Nine the first years. two times they tried to do interactive back in the 90s and the early 2000s, right? So, <laughs> yeah, oh, well, it's like the, uh, you know, the new artist of the year award who's been on tour for 20 years. Right. Well, all right, I'm going to leave some time for questions, but I just want to get everybody's sort of last opinion about business models and what really is, what really is important and what you look for when you're, when you're talking to the development team. Start with Jeff. Uh, we look at who's actually going to be on the project. I mean, we look at the publisher. First of all, you have to think about what you're doing and see how it fits with the publisher. Then we really, really look at the team. There's been times where we just kind of look at it and we look at it and we're like, who's going to be our producer? We're like, oh, so... These guys have shipped 20 games amongst the senior team. He shipped one mobile game, and we're doing a console game. This isn't going to work. So we, we really look at who we're going to be working with on the other team. We just we look at the team, which is funny hearing from you because you're like, we look at the team. We look at the team. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll echo that and just say that we look at the, uh, the historical track record of the team uh, and their ability to deliver and operate free-to-play games. Um, and at this point, I think the bar just continues to rise as uh, you're seeing a lot of people not necessarily move over from your platforms, but have now made top 200, top 100, top 50 grossing games. Um, and those are the teams that are really, uh, you know, companies like us are all dying for. Yeah. Um, team processes, how they think, how they tick, what makes them tick, and how they work together, how they make mistakes and how they fail, and how they learn from that. Um, and then it's about aligning all the interests and figuring out a way to strike a long-term deal. And then we are set. I don't think I have much to add to that. I just, I, I ultimately, it's team and the relationship. I mean, we've seen some great teams that we didn't think we could have a good relationship with. So we passed on some fantastic games. And I think games have gone on to be very successful. But we knew ultimately they probably wouldn't have been successful with us because we would not have had a good relationship with that developer. So... It's, it's the team and its relationship. And I will say one of the things we've learned is a lot, of, a lot of people have spun out of big teams to start their own studios. And individually, they've done a lot. We are unbelievably cautious about those teams until they've shipped something because they don't realize how much was done for them at these big companies until they try to do it on their no own. No matter how good the concept is and how good the, the idea is. Right? We've had a couple games ship that the team, if you look at it on paper, you're like, oh, my God, this should be the best thing ever and you realize that they had no clue of all the little things that were being done for them at this big company with all this big support. And, and that's where a huge, that was, most of that's on us. We didn't, I see that we, a didn't, lot. we didn't do our diligence on can this team deliver all these, all the, again, it's, I hate the football analogy, like getting into the red zone is not that difficult, getting into the end zone is super difficult, and working with people who haven't done it before is even more difficult. So whenever you ask what have you shipped, there's a reason we ask. Shipping something is really hard. Did you notice one thing? Not one person brought up product. No one mentioned a word about product when they said them. Everyone said, to sign a mobile game, we need to see playable, which implies product. 
but when it came to the most important thing, no one's a product. The product <laughs> is the proof that the team can deliver eventually, yeah. and a great team will figure out product. Yeah, yeah I think that I, I was going to echo exactly that. That's no, you mentioned now one person. Yeah. No content didn't come up at all. Yeah. Yeah. All right, well, uh, good teams will make good product. Be interesting to be. So there's very few people that can do art for art's sake. I mean, that's great if you're. You know, if you're that good of an artist and you can just do art and create art and make a living, that's fantastic. And if you, you know, if you're just publishing games and publishing games, are gonna make, but what we really do is a craft. It's where money meets art. And to, tr you know, if you, like, if you got a great rich benefactor who's gonna pay you to make art until you make a lot of money, fantastic. Most of us can't afford to keep investing in hopes that we're gonna make money someday. So what it really is, it's a craft. It's where art meets money meets science. I mean, I always thought the argument of art games aren't always, like, why are we even having the conversation? There's a ton of art in it. There's a ton of programs. But there's also money. And anybody who tries to say it's not about the money must have money coming in from somewhere to not care about it. I don't know about you guys. I don't have that much money coming in not to care. Fully agree. I mean, the, the conscience about having to produce a game that eventually is a good business case or at least has a decent probability to do so is a requirement I would see in a developer to define it as a great team. Um, the other quality is the ability to identify what they don't know about, or at least be able to be educated about what they don't know about by listening and learning, and maybe we are fucking wrong, I don't know, but we can have an open discussion, right? Um, and, and in the end, it's building something together, and knowing about your individual strengths and weaknesses is part of a great team on a developer side as well as on our side. And what we are trying to do as a publisher is to build a publishing team that supplements the strengths and the weaknesses of each individual team by skill set, by seniority, by support in, within our organization. And that's the thing that worked out for us so far. So teams, teams that you look at that would have that mentality of you're sucking life out of it, just not an interesting team to you because of that, right? Um, if it's that strong, I mean, I know that monetization design for most game designers is not f the fun part of their job, um, but um, that's why it's a job. Well, let, let's also, <laughs> let, let's quickly be clear. We, we saw the opposite of that. We did see design by data, which Zynga did for years, and they sucked the life out of all the talented people there. <laughs> and, and so I understand the whole sucking your life, and there is, a, there is a right way and a wrong way to do it. When you let the entire design by, be dictated by data, absolutely. This is where art meets science, right? The data is a science, the game's the art, and you need to meet somewhere in the middle. But you, you again, you've got to have that relationship on both sides where there's a mutual respect, and I'll listen to the guy who knows the science, and I'll let the guy who's designing the game who knows the art, and they'll meet in the middle. Sometimes the artist wins, sometimes the designer wins, but if there's always a disagreement and it never ends well, then you probably shouldn't have done a deal with them in the first place. And jumping in on that again, um, <laughs> where we draw the red line where the decision power should, should be to a certain extent. Design decisions should solely rest with the developer. That's actually what our contract says, literally. Um, our job is to make sure that they are able to make smart decisions. And when they make a stupid decision, it's our job to prove that there is another decision they could have made that would have been better. And then we burned some money and there was a learning. Fair, that's an investment. That's why we go for long-term uh, relationships because then, we, then it pays off over time. But design decisions should only be with the developer and we have to help them to make the best ones with experience, with data, with other proof cases, with whatever, um, and that is our job. And if repeatedly a developer makes stupid decisions and doesn't learn from it, and we don't manage, for whatever reason, relationship, people, chemistry, communication, to help them get better in decision making, then we shouldn't work together. Uh, so I guess one of the big changes I've seen over the last 10 years is uh, an erosion of uh, the value or the leverage that licensors, like you know, whether it's a movie studio, big brands, whatever they might have, have had, but at the same time they have a growing appetite to get into the space. Um, you know, with the likes of the Kim Kardashian Blue Deal being non-traditional and these players getting more creative uh, about the, the deals they're willing to do because their as their desperation grows, where do you see licenses now fitting into the, 
develop a publisher relationship and what opportunities does that create for both developers and publishers? I'm going to make a snide comment real quick and then we'll let SMB else not put their foot in their mouth. <laughs> Two words, user acquisition. Yeah, same here. Licensing costs are a part of the user acquisition budget. For, for mobile, absolutely. Uh, I think the, it's, it's almost critical unless you're a successful studio that's got a, got a track record, has an audience, has a, a, a community to market to. It is absolutely an acquisition tool, and it is unbelievably valuable. I think now, um, we did, I did some simple research a long time ago. On console and PC, a license in general will hurt you. Uh, it'll cost you five to 10 points in your review score in general, unless it's absolutely an amazing game. I think, I hate to keep going back to Payday, but what Payday did was fantastic. Obviously, they created a successful game first, but then they went out and they got John Wick content. They have Goat Simulator in there. So what they've done is they've gone out and got some funny licenses, they've got some serious licenses. So they've partnered with people, but that's to drive more users as a user acquisition tool, but it came from a different position and a position of power. I think launching with a licensed property in the console or PC space now is so incredibly hard unless you have the perfect license with the perfect developer and the perfect game and is not tied to a movie release. If you're trying to tie to a day and date to something, forget about it, move on. Um, that's it. It's well, you look, they've launched two other similar games. They've bombed pretty miserably, right? So you think that... Oh, well, that's, yeah, let's also not forget the game was incredible. I mean, even without the Kim Kardashian thing, obviously it wouldn't have done as well, but the underlying game was really solid. Do you think the, the licensors, and it's probably a different, different, longer question, do you think the licensors are, are recognizing the value in a different fashion as, as opposed to a big console release back in the day? Well, for mobile, a lot of them are funding them themselves, yeah. but they're using them as marketing tools, but that's also why most of them aren't very good. Hi, I'm curious, uh, as a publisher, do you look at your users and when you do these deals, games do you think about your users and your games as individual entities or is it important to you that the that the individual the end user understands that you're the publisher this is your brand all of these games are part of your portfolio and you try to leverage that to for ua or whatever other it is um, for us it's evolving to the second part of the question so in the past we've been thinking about individual games individual experiences um, and now that we have a portfolio of games and see the economic uplift from cross-promoting users and sending them through our universe when we've identified them to be uh, not converting in one game or churning out of a game by, because they have less activity, um, it is a huge economic uplift, not only in, in the conversion, uh, when you look at uh, audience overlap within a portfolio and look at that when you are doing the portfolio planning already, uh, so that's something that we definitely do, um, on the other end, what we've seen is that users that you send from one game to another within our portfolio, they, con uh, they, they uh, convert significantly more, they have bigger baskets, they stay longer. So the average performance uplift is like times four, times five in comparison to the best other source that we can get. Um, and that is significant. Anybody else want to weigh in on that? I was gonna, it, for us, it depends on the game. It depends on the genre. It depends on the audience. I mean, we, again, our, we're, we're, kind of, we, we're kind of that weird outlier here. I think we, we publish, I mean, you're free to play. Nexon's free to play. We publish both free to play and traditional premium. So we always try to leverage the communities, but you, especially in the traditional console PC side, sometimes those communities don't overlap very well, and trying to force them to overlap is actually a huge mistake. Uh, so for us, it really depends on the, on the product and the title and the genre. And, and we've learned what we're pretty good at and what we're not. We're not good at simple, casual family games on any platform. So we've <coughs> pretty much stayed away now. And so our users can, on free-to-play, cross-pollinate quite well. It doesn't work quite as well on console for the most part. So I, I think it just, again, it's a game-by-game -game basis. Obviously, because user acquisition is so expensive, if we don't have to go out and buy new users, it just makes more money for everybody. But if we have to, that's kind of what you have to do. I just want to ask questions about Nixon uh, specifically because like there's this game that Nixon just released like recently, like Blade and Souls just came to US. I just want to know like what change have been made because back in the past, like Nixon games that get to US haven't made that big of a pub publicity, right? But with in case of Blade and Souls, like there's a change of how I don't know how probably how internet have changed and how the games is now distributed to Steam. So I just want to like 
you know, to Steam at the moment. And I just want to know, like, how uh, relationship with uh, Steam have helped uh, Blade and Souls to uh, become popular. Uh, how do you say? Get more publicity than the previous games. I actually hate to disappoint on this one, but I can't really comment on that. Uh, as yeah, I wasn't I really so. involved on the PC side, so I'll come find you afterwards and maybe we can chat a little bit. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming, and enjoy the rest of the conference.